Welcome back to Think Tech. Welcome back to View from the North uh, with our old friend Ken Rogers. The question is, what will Trump do uh, when he's elected? If and when he's elected, we'll see what the probabilities are. And the subtitle is, you won't like it at all. Welcome to the show, Ken. <laughs> I think this subject is a very scary one. Um, I think it's scarier for the United States than for Canada. But, uh, you know, if Trump's elected, I just think it's nice and simple, the end of democracy as it's now known. Well, let's let's break it down a little bit. I made a little list. It's out of the Mikado. It's not a happy list, but here's the list. Um, and, you know, it's not just that these things would happen in the U.S., because they all have implications beyond the U.S., including Canada. So the first thing on my little list is uh, he would appoint a new and completely loyal cabinet. He's had a problem with members of his first cabinet. They've turned against him. They're part of the vermin that he will ultimately punish. Um, but he will now appoint a new and completely loyal cabinet, which will never question him, which will do anything and everything he asks, including things that are clearly illegal and unconstitutional. Um, any thoughts about what that means to have a cabinet of acolytes? I think that the, the early days of a, of a new Trump um, presidency would be uh, focused on revenge, mm. you know, the, and secondly, on, you know, the elimination of a good percentage of the existing civil service, you know, yeah. and, and really the whole thing will be oriented to which department can they gut first and which can they gut the fastest, you know, and, and one would think of, you know, the, the FBI and the CIA would be reasonably high on the list, uh, you know, ones that would be, um, you know, wonderful and expand might be Department of Energy, um, you know, it, it certainly eliminate anybody in that uh, department that's worried about climate change, but uh, they would really push that. And, and I think that would occupy a fair length of time you know, is is all of the revenge actions would get some uh, opposition from, uh, you know, a variety of quarters in the U.S., but um, I don't know whether they would be sufficient that, uh, that he would uh, invoke the Insurrection Act. But I certainly think if there's any significant opposition that he would have no hesitation whatsoever to use the a U.S. military to try to, you know, kick the public uh, into line. Yeah, no, I, I, I didn't include the military on, on my list, but you're absolutely right. Um, he, he tried to, um, you know, uh, uh, suborn and corrupt the military in many ways, including having all these retired military officers uh, in his cabinet, which uh that's the, actually i don't think that's legal um but in this case uh, he would he would switch out the anybody at the at the management level you know um the chief of staff people and and he would um he would again you know find acolytes who would take his his every command and then he would command them i think he would command them to do things that were completely illegal he'd make him his his personal army his personal military um while while he was chasing millie general millie around and trying to put him in jail and have him executed i think is what trump said he wanted to do with millie so he would have um, he would set it up so that they were all loyal to him just like the cabinet um and he could have them act as his personal army and you're right the insurrection act would come into play uh, if anybody um you know, I mean, you know, we, we've been using the word insurrection um, on, on the January 6th protest. But in fact, it, the Insurrection Act would be something that he would use to quell any protest against him or against his illegal activities. Um, so you're right. Uh, the military is a key um, part to that. 
And, you know, and you're right, getting even is, would be a, a big feature. And I don't, I don't think it's that hard, you know, because he, he, he will have a, a, an attorney general that does his bidding. He will have, he will completely, like maybe Clark, the, you know, the, the guy who almost got to be attorney general in the last days of Trump's administration, uh, who is an acolyte. And, and he would have the attorney general, you know, go after anybody on a little list. The Mikado list. And she whiz, there's a lot of people on that list. Anybody that ever spoke out in public against him, any anybody who turned against him, everybody who was in the Oval Office uh, or in the cabinet or wrote a book or had an article or an interview against him, there's a lot of people. And these people would be on the Mikado list. And um he would have the Department of Justice, the Attorney General, prosecute them. Well that, that wouldn't take much effort on his part, just make the list. Well, he may be able, able to get uh, – there are smart Republicans in my mind, and there are some smart Republicans that will simply salute and do whatever Trump wishes. And a smart Republican would say, well, if you want to get revenge and beat people up, do it via the tax department or somewhere that's a little sneakier than simply you know, trying to throw – Joe Biden in jail, you know, or throw Hillary Clinton in jail, or or you know, General Milley or somebody like that. Um, <clears throat> the um, in theory, Congress is about the only check on the president, and and really, under the Trump sort of measure of uh, of dominance. Uh, Congress seems pretty helpless. Like you can even have appointments of what what appointments are Congress to make. Well, Trump kind of got around that the last time by having everybody in a temporary position. Yeah, that's right. Uh, recess recess appointments, and uh, they wouldn't be confirmed. Wouldn't need to be confirmed. Um, yeah, I, I absolutely agree. That's a very salient point here. And, and by the way, it's not it's not sure that either house will be a Democratic house next time. Um, you know, the, the the Senate may turn Republican too. So if you had a, a house and a Senate that's Republican, he'd control it all because he controls the the party, the and including, of course, the right wing group, the Freedom Caucus. Yeah. Um, and uh, what comes out of this? Go ahead. Um, I, a question that I'm not sure of is. Um, is uh, how could he get rid of the filibuster? He could, he could if he if he controlled it all, and you know it's possible to get rid well, of it. Well, if there, if let's say there's um, forty five or forty eight uh, Democratic senators, you know the, it's pretty hard to get to the sixty level. Do, do you need the sixty level to get rid of the filibuster? I don't remember the vote count, but uh, it depends on how many he had, and if he could uh, uh, get rid of the filibuster, that you know the minority party would have no chance. Well, but, I don't you know, think... even even assuming that he can't, even assuming that the filibuster rule stays in place, which I think you're right, he would he would want to get rid of it and have a a, a free path to wherever he wants to go. Um, I think the fact is that Congress right now. Is pretty much ineffectual, and the likelihood is, at the least, I mean, the best case analysis, it would remain ineffectual during his administration, and the worst case analysis is he would control both houses and maybe even without the filibuster. Uh, Congress is not going to be an obstacle to him, at least as it presently appears. I wanted to talk about uh, civil liberties because that's the part that really scares me. We have civil liberties, you know, the the Bill of Rights, so to speak. Ten, 10 amendments. We have the rule of law, which where you have judges who follow precedent and try to do the right thing. And then you have um, the Constitution, which we, we find uh, may not be as, um, as um, respected or enforceable as we thought. I mean, one good example is uh, the 14th Amendment, Section 3, which prohibits Anyone involved in an insurrection and who, you know, from holding federal office where there's all these issues, unbelievable. 
And I'm not at all confident that the Supreme Court will enforce it on the plain language of that section. So the Constitution, you know, is at issue, Ken. And if he were in office, um, there would be a lot of issues and he would ignore it. In fact, he said that. He said that he doesn't, you know, he doesn't respect the Constitution and he wants to knock off parts of it. Well, one of the very unusual things about the American governmental system is that the president really has pretty absolute power. If he works at you it. You know, the, the, the president can, uh, you know, uh, that all of the civil service, in theory, works for him. The FBI, the CIA, the Justice Department, the Tax Department, they all work for him. And that if uh, Congress, you know, has the ability to adjust the budget, you know, but if, uh, you know, if the existing Congress is made up of a whole bunch of Josh Hawley's and, and Jim Jordan's, uh, what the heck could you expect other than, you know, whatever Trump wanted to do with any department and anything uh, would happen? I mean, I really think there's zero chance that democracy would survive if Trump, Trump is reappointed. Well, he has said, he has said as much. <clears throat> and uh, you know, if you if you string together his comments over the last couple of months, you will see exactly where he's headed. It's it's not a it's not going to be a surprise. These possibilities are not going to be a surprise. So you know, Congress uh, has public policy issues, um, personal rights issues like uh, abortion, uh, like gun control, um, like uh, bigotry and anti-Semitism and the like. Um, I don't think Congress would you know, would intercede in any of that. And, and Trump has a way of uh, fomenting it. Um, so at the end of the day, abortion would be impossible in this country. Gun control would be impossible in this country. And uh, he would take steps to make sure that bigotry was happening all over. You know, divide and conquer. If you have a country, <laughs> you know, in a civil war that's divided in so many ways, um, then you as the autocrat are more powerful. Standard operating procedure. So uh, the condition of Congress is really important. And if they follow him on those kinds of things and his policies about those issues, um, it'll, it'll really get worse. And it'll affect anyone. You know, the loss of civil liberties, um, the loss of, um, you know, these, these social protections um, is going to affect everybody in the country. That's why it's extraordinary that there are people out there, Ken, I'm not kidding, who would vote for him. Either they know what you and I are saying here today, or they don't know. But they would nevertheless vote for him and bring the whole shebang down on their own heads, shooting themselves in the foot in every single way. I mean, just think we talked a moment ago about, um, you know, civil rights, the Bill of Rights. Uh, include, that includes the First Amendment, right? Um, what would happen to the newspapers and the, uh, and the news organizations in the country? You mean you mean all the all the fake news? All the fake news, and yeah. it would, it, they could go away, and there would be no news. It would be propaganda, just like Putin. Well, I would expect that uh, you know he'll will take um, in the early days the items like the revenge and and obliterating the civil service will take top priority. But but I think that that he will have a mixture of other things that would have some support from some circles. Example, um, the, the southern border. You know, if you just start and take whatever policy there is, just change it to say, the, the door's closed, period, stop. You know, like that would, that would be a popular decision for a lot of people and a lot of his base and certainly you know, states like Texas would think that's a wonderful thing and probably ignore what's happening elsewhere. Yeah. Um, well, remember, he also said he wanted to, he didn't like migrants too much, and he was going to put them in camps. And those, you know, those, those would be detention, large detention camps with thousands of people in them, either, you know, in mainland U.S. or in Guantanamo or somewhere like that. And so you completely deprive them of any rights. Um, so I think he would, yes, I agree with you. He would close the, the border. There would be those who support 
like Abbott in Texas and many people in Texas who support that. But those are the people that he caught and put in camps. They would be, hmm, they would be in terrible shape because he wouldn't offer them any civil liberties at all. Uh, and in fact, nobody would have, you know, civil liberties. The Department of Justice wouldn't enforce it. And he would be, you know, we saw him appoint over 300 judges to the federal bench in his first term. And it really turned a lot of them, like Eileen Cannon, uh, you know, into Trumpers. And um, I mean, they, they remain loyal to him even till today in the Miralago case. Yeah. But I think he would, do, he would do it again, wouldn't he? He would pump out more judges, and well, including Supreme Court judges. We'd turn further right. I would suspect they will figure he would figure out a way to eliminate existing judges. I don't know how, but I think that that you know changing the judiciary is much much like eliminate the New York Times, eliminate the Washington Post, eliminate you know uh, press generally or get it so it's biased press it only reports what he wants not unlike the the russian propaganda machine however um you know the a few of the actions would remain somewhat constant that is biden has been pretty strong in in anti china moves and i think that that would be about the same with Trump, uh, even though I think he likes China, Russia, Iran, North Korea more than he likes Britain, France, Canada, Australia. <laughs> you know, he just seems to ally with uh, autocrats, uh, even though the theoretical philosophy is different than the American way of life as it exists today. Um, but. Uh, <clears throat> I don't see too much that that would remain um, wonderful about the United States. Uh, you know, it would be a major problem for Canada. About the only thing in Canada that would probably do well uh, if Trump's reelected is our oil and gas industry. Mm. You know, is is he certainly wants to promote? You know, no climate rules, no environmental rules for the American oil and gas industry and wants to just, you know, turn up the jets as much as you can to pump out more oil, more gas, and try to dominate the uh, world energy supply. And, and one of the keys to um, LNG is that, um, you know, is it would be easy for the U.S. under a Trump admin to import natural gas from Canada can, and and convert it into LNG in the United States, basically taking a, a good percentage of what it's worth, uh, you know, making it American solely because, uh, you know, Canada has trouble uh, with uh, policies that would get pipelines to any of the oceans. <laughs> yep. Well, I, you know, I, I think oil and gas is just sort of the, uh, it's a big thing, but it's the top of the iceberg in the sense that we would have a transactional president. In other words, if somebody would pay him to adopt the policy, some large multinational corporation, what have you, would pay him to adopt the policy like oil and gas, he would. Um, and, uh, and we, you know, we have to remember that during his first administration, he was in there trying to make money for himself and his family, you know, he used every angle he could possibly use um, to make money to, you know, become more and more ridiculously wealthy, at least in his own mind. And uh, it's like other autocrats. Other autocrats are, are worth billions and billions and billions. Putin, for example, God knows what Xi Jinping is worth. And, you know, I just saw the other day that uh, some of these Hamas guys um, you know, living in Qatar, um, they're worth billions. Well, well, the people are starving in, uh, in Gaza. It's so interesting. But anybody who's an autocrat, including Viktor Orban in Hungary, can get to be very wealthy on this transactional basis where uh, organizations, companies, who knows, people who support a given program will pay you 
uh, you know, and, and uh, give you benefit if you adopt their policies. And that's what he would do. It would be unbridled. Oil and gas is the beginning, but there's every other thing. I mean, for example, weapons manufacturers, right? We we would be uh, we wouldn't do anything good uh, in terms of um, you know Eastern Europe, but we would be selling weapons all over the world, and they would be paying him off for that, and he would give them benefits for that. There are others well, too. When you mention Eastern Europe, I think one of the first people on his list of for revenge would be Volinsky, you know, so that, uh, you know, hello, Putin, you know, I just got elected yesterday, you can have Ukraine. That's what he said. He said that. You know, he said he would you know, end the war immediately upon his election, and that means he would give Ukraine and, and Zelensky to, um, to Putin right away, day one, easy, the yeah. stroke of a pen. Well, importantly, you might have... Um, the day before that, he might, you know, pull the U.S. out of NATO. I think that would be one key thing. He doesn't seem to like international organizations more as the U.S. can live on isolation. You know, well, certainly for his lifetime, that might work. Just what's left after he's too old to be alive or somebody dispenses up him <laughs> with him <laughs> along the way um the um you know where um i certainly think that you know there'd be a big mess certainly the world's effort to deal with climate change would be dramatically reversed you know is is certainly he doesn't give a hoot about any of the environmental issues and and you know the um, anything that's being done will stop being done if it's taking any capital, any money, and and the choice of in the various departments so that they dismantle the civil service. The first people to be to be kicked out will be anybody that's dealing with climate change. You know, he did a lot to uh, undermine those agencies in his first term. Um, um, uh, somebody I know in state government took a trip um, to Washington shortly after Trump was elected, and you know, and it was in 2017. And he walked around um, the State Department, for example, and you could hear a pin drop. He said when he came back that Trump had somehow dispatched the, um, all these staff members in the State Department and uh, in the Environmental Protection. Um, part of the government. You're right. These agencies have already been reduced in the first. And I don't know if Biden has fixed that. But it's very clear that if Trump is reelected, he will wipe out some of these agencies that offend him, the environmental agencies, the foreign relations agencies, and so forth. And the risk of that, and it was an article recently that I saw to this point, is that if you go isolationist, and you reduce government, and you have an autocrat, you have, of course, you shift the world's power. You shift the, the power blocks, and you have large power blocks. But you also have a higher risk of world war. You have a higher risk of one country invading another and creating a war. And this was happening both for World War I and obviously for World War II. Um, so it's risky business when you go isolationist. The U.S. was quite isolationist before World War II. And, and uh, had the Japanese not bombed Pearl Harbor, um, FDR would have had a problem in getting people to support a war um, because yeah. they were isolationist. You know? Germany might have won. You bet. And, and I mean, we, we hesitate to think of that, but that's the, those are the stakes we're playing with here. Yes. Well, I mean, you could extrapolate and say, much like um, one of the early things would be to gift Putin uh, Ukraine, but the next would be, you know, uh, even though he may have anti-China uh, policies with regard to trade and, and such things, simply say, well, you can have Taiwan. Right. Exactly. But, like, U.S. won't do any 
fight stuff. You know, no, to the do. US not, not, under him, the U.S. would not resist that, right? He would treat Probably. it as a transaction with Xi Jinping. Um, yep. And, and, and the, to the extent that he supports the military and cozies up to them and, um, you know, corrupts their leadership, um, that's not so that he would have a strong military to um, defend other places in the world. No, he's an isolationist. So um, what is he doing it for? To have a military that works for him domestically, to convert the, the U.S. military to his own army. That's what, that's what I think. That's why he cozies up. That's why he and the MAGAs like to give the military a lot of money so the military feels good about it and would follow his instructions. But I want to go back to the social safety net, you know. There's talk that... Um, Mike Johnson wants to undo Social Security and Obamacare. Actually, yesterday, Trump said he was one of his platform positions is he wants to repeal, repeal Obamacare, although it has been very successful as it is not it's not socialized medicine, but it's more democratic medicine. Um, he wants to repeal it if he gets elected. And the social safety net programs, there's so many of them. He would he would repeal them all. Um, so what happens to the country if he gets into office? All these people who were uninformed and vote for him, they wouldn't have the benefit of Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, Obamacare, all that gone. Well, wow. I would. Yeah, I believe it would go a step further. Um, in a look at the area of education, hmm. and and really, if you look at what the major Republican donors keep pushing is you shouldn't really have public education. People should, it should all be private education. And if you can't pay for it, too bad. Right. You know, exactly. I, I really think that that's, that's how do you eliminate the size of government? And if you keep pushing that to the, to the limit, you know, that, that's one of the key areas that, you know, how to reduce an awful lot of, you know, civil servants is, you know, just if all education, you know, is paid for. And, and you know, your thing about Obamacare, you really get, you know, a variety of the health plans. And you simply say everything should be pay as you go. The government's not going to subsidize too much. Then you get less and less and less government. And, and for an autocrat, that generally is a good thing. <laughs> yeah, well, no, and, and part of the educational, the other the other hand clapping on the educational system is that so people are not so well educated. On the other hand, um, they listen to right-wing radio, right-wing television, and propaganda. And uh, he would encourage that. He's trying to knock off the funding for PBS and NPR. I mean, incredible. Um, so the, the, it, the whole the whole complexion of, of public media would change. So on the one hand, you have people who are not educated because they can't afford it. Um, and on the other hand, you have people who are being educated de facto by right-wing propaganda organizations. That's what happens in Russia. Uh, those kids are getting it every day. The people are getting it with Russian TV. And he is, Putin is training them to think like he wants them to think. So you you recreate public opinion that way. Um, that's what a good autocrat would always want to do. That's what Hitler well, did. Well, importantly, though, you can like, I would not see the Republican side, the Trump-led Republican side, uh, really eliminating, you know, education in the sense of engineering and sciences. You know, the the idea would be nobody should get a PhD in English or philosophy or psychology or, you know, any of the arts. I mean, who cares about that from an autocrat point of view? You know, we don't want educated people that have these liberal subjects as their background knowledge, you know, because most people that take those subjects are small L liberal in most of their thinking. Um, you know, but 
you've got, you know, for an autocrat to be successful, you need a good, strong army and you need good engineering and science people. And, you know, basically you got, um, you know, examples of how that works well. Now, the way China will go to, let's say, the best universities in the world and they'll put up a research grant of some sort and so you got phd students lining up to to join in the research project that uh, that china's learning all about mm -hmm. yeah and you know, they bring using, it back to china you know like an indirect way of of stealing uh, you know any uh, technological improvements that the west makes the you know the chinese get a pipeline into how to how to get it for free and to try to not just catch up or stay up stay even but try to even get ahead of where uh, the us and the eu are now in terms of any technological advantages yeah so um, you know, if if you shake it and bake it, what it looks like here when we examine what will Trump do when he's reelected, uh, and the implications are very scary. As civil liberties, the rule of law, that would be gone. The social safety net, that would be gone. Um, people would be poor, and they wouldn't they wouldn't know too much. Um, they wouldn't realize what was happening to them. To the extent they protested, to the extent that anybody spoke up against this autocrat who is increasingly powerful, um, those people would, would be prosecuted or put in jail for no reason. Um, and, uh, you know, think that's what Putin does. And then, of course, this is the thing, that if you don't like it and you want to go into uh, protest mode, if you want to um, organize something, you know, on the street, he brings the army in. And they quell that disturbance. So autocracy can be very unpleasant. And at the end of the day, if you if you don't have um, a social safety net, uh, you go hungry. And you and if you don't have medical support, you get sick and you die. It's life and death we're talking about. To the extent the American ideal, and I suppose this you know has a a kind of effect on, on Canada, we should talk about that. Uh, to the extent the American ideal seeks to have a good life for everybody, good, healthy, well-fed life for everybody, that would really disappear. And people would be dying for one reason or another. That's the problem of autocracy. The society would be reshaped. The, the, the demograph, the demography would be reshaped. And you wouldn't have much of a life left. It, it really sounds bloody awful. Um, now, question, how would this affect Canada? Well, it would affect Canada completely in the sense that um, uh, we have a, you know, many thousand miles of border uh, that, uh, you know, today you could, you know, if you really wanted to, you could walk across without somebody even knowing it. Um, you know, just that it just so happens that uh, people come and go um, through the border crossings, you know, like good citizens should. Uh, but uh, one of the starts, if he immediately started closing the border, the south border, including all the legal crossings and and looking, you know, A for, you know, people smuggling. But if you're going to really grind down on people smuggling, you're also say, well, we're also doing drug smuggling at the same time. Well, it won't take much before the drug smuggling to switch. You know, they'll fly to Canada somehow or get to Canada because, you know, Canada is easier to get into uh, if you're nefarious because we have an unlimited number of, uh, of borders. Um, and uh, and then try to get into the U.S. Well, that will then start causing border problems between Canada and the U.S. And there was some Trumper uh, not too long ago saying that uh, that the um, U.S. should build a border wall across Canada as well. You know, well, 
if you carried the Trump uh, uh, mess uh, to to some limits, you would start to get that way. I mean, in eventually the U.S. would be more like Russia economically than like the U.S. is today, or or to a lesser extent China, where in Russia, you know, nearly half of their gross domestic product is spent on defense. You know, well, that's what keeps Putin in power, you know, and that would be the autocratic move. Well, it would take enough years that, that Trump would be dead by then. You know, given that his, his age, I don't think he's going to, you know, keep all his marbles if he has that many now uh, for too many more years. Um, <clears throat> so that, you know, who who's going to replace him or what's going to happen then? Uh, you know, and now I'm sure Trump himself doesn't care about that. Um, <clears throat> however, in the Canadian scenario, we're sitting in the short run. Uh, one of the big defensive things is is the North American defense, like NORAD. And you have all of these bases in the northern parts of Canada that uh, that are all now pretty obsolete. You know, if you if you look at the problems in Israel right now of their, um, uh, you know, ability to, you know, knock off missiles, they're doing a, a phenomenal job, but there's still a big, you know, a percentage, an unacceptable percentage getting through. You know, well, you know, if it's uh, Russia or China firing or North Korea or Iran sending IC international Continental ballistic missiles, uh, you know, at uh, hypersonic speed, you know, certainly the NORAD system wouldn't knock those out, you know, so that, a, a, you know, a good autocrat or even, you know, a Biden type admin should be shoring up that uh, NORAD system, you know, and I think that would be a high priority. And, and but, um, you know, how Trump would accomplish that is probably different than how Biden would do it. Like Biden agrees, you know, thinks in terms of cooperation. Trump, Trump would do it, you know, coercively or, or you know, just send in the army, and, you know, obliterate well, Canada. Well, part of what you're saying, I think, relates to the enormous possibilities of AI and facial recognition. You know, think of Think of the suppression of civil rights in China. Uh, an autocrat in this country would use the same technology, would learn from China, uh, would identify everybody. We'd all be in a database elsewhere, and it would be brutal for us. Life here would be brutal, and and uh, you know, and I think there would be violence. And maybe if if uh, if he died during his office, or if he passed it off to another autocrat. Uh, gee whiz, it would be it would be hard to live here, and um, especially for people like you and me. Well, you live in Canada, but especially especially people like you and me, you know, who remember the the good old days, and we would miss the good old days when we saw everything deteriorating around us, including street violence. You know, I think at the end of the day, um, the, you know, the bottom line of everything we've talked about is violence in the street or a complete dissatisfaction with the quality of life in the country and the economy in the country. It's another discussion. But it seems to me that, you know, you talk about building walls between the U.S. and Canada and between the U.S. and Mexico. Canada will have an onslaught of immigrant migrants from the United States who want to, who want to live the Canadian dream because it'll be the only dream around. Um, and and there'll be people who want to who want to go south across the border from the United States to Mexico because it'll be reversed. If migrants go the other way, then um, and and they go to Europe. I know people who are planning to do that. They're they're making plans. They they are worried about what might happen in this country. What is happening in this country or Asia? So I think well, the world is going to reform itself and travel and migrancy my. Yes, that's the right word. Migrancy is going to increase if he is elected. Um, 
I believe that it'll be worse than that because I really think that that um, you know if he had his way and it was simple. You know, and it wouldn't be simple to just start off with this is the objective. Is the United States would be a white only country? What do you do? You know, you know, what do you do? You make scapegoats and then you somehow punish them. How do you get rid of a hundred million Americans that are not white? <laughs> you know, that's you know, but uh. You know the you know when you mention the Canada thing, I mean, um, um, you have energy independence is a big item, not like our energy security, and and so that one of the important moves you know that Trump would do on his own is is really push the oil and gas industry, but when you say what does Canada think? is how long would it take before he would like to take Alberta and Saskatchewan? Ooh, you know, there's a thought. Well, a it, thought. It's, a, it's a pretty simple, straightforward one, really. Uh, um, you know, you've even had, you know, they, because the, the pro, those two provinces are always the ones with the greatest disputes with the federal government in Canada. You know, because the federal government likes to have rules that are good for Ontario and Quebec, and they're less favorable for the energy producing provinces. And and we have several um, laws in Canada that that really, you know, almost require any sizable manufacturing will occur in Quebec or Ontario. And that all of the other provinces' purpose in life is to supply raw materials to the, you know, central Canada. Yeah. You know, which, um, you know, it's certainly not what the way is in the U.S. However, you know, for simple energy security, uh, the, the Alberta oil sands in particular, you know, has, um, you know, <laughs> enough oil to supply the well, U.S. A, for, a, for it's, it's an attractive yes. target for an autocrat who wants to take things or make transactional arrangements to take things. But one thing, we, we're out of time, Ken, but one thing I, I'd like to say here at the end of it is that uh, timing is very important here. And I don't think that, um, you know, we wrap our minds, we all of us wrap our minds around how fast these changes could happen. And I would, I would warn anybody listening or watching that these, that with a, with a, a, a an unimpeded autocrat coming into office who, who knows the score and how to advance his own power, uh, things could happen uh, very, very quickly. And it would surprise everyone, but it shouldn't be. Thank one you, thing Ken. I, one thing I could add is Canadians cannot believe that Trump is even a viable candidate. We just can't imagine that Americans could be so stupid as to even consider electing him. With well, that, I'd like yeah. to say hello. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Ken Rogers, Dr. Ken Rogers in Kelowna, British Columbia. Thank you so much for joining us today. Aloha.